it is a conditional probability of seeing y given x. So of course there are many restrictions that you should take into account before going from here to here. But anyway, uh, so you do not get scared. Um, so do you think it would be any better than just the logistic regression? What, what do you think? I think so. We are having much more parameters now, right? Sorry, I, it seems like my neighbors uh, decided to do some heavy construction. I, 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 I didn't hear you. Could you please repeat your answer? I, I said that I think so because we are having uh, much more parameters now. OK, yeah, we have more parameters, but uh, let's uh, like take a look uh, how those parameters actually uh, transform. Uh, so if we just um, expand the brackets here. Mm, so we get something like this, so we have uh, X I multiplied by by product of WJ and WIH, so just those two guys. And uh, and then we have uh, a more complicated uh, scalar bias term. So essentially, we can we can say okay, <laughs> uh, we have more complicated uh, linear um, linear Mm, vector that is multiplied by xi and and more complicated uh, bias term. So it, uh, in, in, in that case, it will not be very different from a higher dimension logistic regression. Uh, but it, it, in this, essentially it will still be a logistic regression. So we do not move outside of the class that, that would allow us to build some some features because Logistic regression uh, is not able to design features that, that we hope for. And uh, the, the way how can we introduce uh, new features is actually pretty simple. So we just add one more block between those two guys. So between linear model and regression, we add a nonlinearity function. And, and um, if we plug it into a, a equation, um, here we, we are not able to, uh, to, to reduce it to a logistic regression anymore. So it will be something more complicated. And um, Illustration for, for those nonlinear features uh, could be the following. So the, uh, imagine you want to recognize a handwritten digits and uh, in, in, in the right hand side you have and you plug it in into some kind of stack of linear models interconnected with uh, those nonlinear components. And on the right, you have uh, probabilities for uh, classifying those images as numbers from zero to ten to nine. And uh, usually, you uh, you build a little more complicated objects than than linear regression. I mean, you you uh, for for images, you usually uh, need convolutional blocks that that uh, we are not going to cover today, um, but uh, still you can can think of something that happens inside uh, this linear regression model as a uh, identification of some characteristic patterns in the image uh, that come that are then combined into some high level representation of the original image. So you see those strange 
patterns uh, that, that actually uh, give us hint about some particular uh, curves or, or some, 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 some part of images that then combine to something more, more uh, similar to human readable images and then uh, plugging in those objects into logistic regression gives us gives us uh, probability of being mm, uh, being one of nine or ten classes. And what kind of nonlinearity you can plug in? Uh, there are many many different cases. Most popular are uh, Relu. Well, maybe not not the most popular, but quite popular, which uh, looks uh, like this red line. But also, um, but also you can uh, plug in other kind of nonlinear functions as well. And so they they, they differ uh, from each other in the way how does it. How does it? Uh, how does it? How fast does it allow to converge to a zero? So, since uh, we're talking about minim minimization uh, problem, uh, minimum seats uh, usually around zero, and and, uh, and sigmoid. Um, sorry, this uh, tangent function. Uh, is is uh, also re reduces the reduces outputs to zero around here, uh, but but uh, you see that the slope of those functions is very different, and and it means that convergence or, or gradient that you compute with respect to those functions will also um, be converging to the minimum with different speed. And uh, so with ReLU, it's kind of straightforward. So it, it's straightforward how to compute and straightforward how to uh, how to how to get to zero. And and, and ReLU is, uh, is is just this function. So it is a maximum of uh, zero and second argument or, uh, x. And so uh, the, the question, next question is, how do we uh, actually train such uh, an, a formula? So if we have a uh, expression like this, how do we find optimum weights that would minimize objective function? Do you have any ideas? Sim simulation, Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, simulation of what? Um, simula Monte Carlo simulation. Well, uh, using Markov change uh, of, of variables and, and start to, yeah. to replicate. I, I, I think it, it could be done, yes, via Markov, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. But uh, the thing is, it, it's not uh, that difficult to compute this thing, just taking a gradient with respect to parameters. So with Markov chain, you would require to sample many, many different configurations of those Ws. And, and uh, it would be very time consuming because you would need to cover big phase space of possible configurations. Do you think there are better ways for this? Gradient descent. Exactly. We can, we can, uh, apply the same procedure that we did before. 
So we can train it with uh, gradient descent approach. So since we can compute the derivative with respect to those parameters, uh, we can do gradient descent. And actually, um, it is a very powerful procedure as soon as your function is differentiable. And um, in mathematics, it is called uh, a chain rule, or so you can you can compute uh, the derivative of a function over the another function uh, using the following procedure. So we just take a derivative of uh, in internal function and then take derivative of external function with respect to treating this internal function as an argument. So it is it is a simple mathematical procedure, especially uh, uh, where G and NX can be vectors uh, or tensors or uh, matrices. So so you can um, you can do it by hand and computer can do it for you as well. So let's uh, take a short uh, animation or illustration how those parameters are get tuned if we have configuration of the mm, learner like this. So we start with uh, linear units, H linear units, then we apply nonlinear part, then we add uh, one linear unit, then nonlinear part and get the prediction. So the, the function, uh, so derivative of the loss function with respect to uh, parameters is the following. So we uh, want to compute, uh, want to compute derivative with respect to W1. So we take, uh, <clears throat> we take a derivative with respect to sigma. So here is a red line that goes from right to left. Then we take uh, derivative with respect to the second linear unit parameters. Then we take derivative with respect to uh, first non first nonlinear uh, unit, and then uh, we take it with respect to uh, linear one and uh, their particular weight w one. Uh, and, and, and it is, there are mathematical uh, toolbox, sorry, program, program, pro, programmable ways how you can compute those derivatives automatically given the expression of your function in some computational form, in the Python, for example. So if you, if you write in the Python uh, that, that um, expression, uh, for L, then you can take this derivative automatically. And this uh, is, is a very powerful thing. So those auto differentiable and after auto differentiable <clears throat> uh, code uh, does all the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So if we want to take uh, a matrix derivatives, so <clears throat> how do you compute this? So you have X multiplied uh, by matrix W plus bias term B, the X. Uh, what do you think should be uh, put here? So uh, a small hint. So let's uh, recall what, what was here in the scalar case. And uh, we just need to match uh, shapes for a matrix. So if, if we uh, naively apply the chain rule, that would be the partial of x times w plus b divided by the partial of x. 
yeah, so essentially it would be uh, the following thing. So <clears throat> it's uh, not not very difficult, and it, it also computers and those auto uh, differentiable frameworks can deal with those uh, matrices uh, as well. And uh, if we want to compute uh, uh, this uh, thing, uh, what do you think should it be? Well, this is X, no? Yeah, so it's uh, XT. Multiple, so it's, we have to transpose it, uh, and and uh, then then we have to uh, multiply it, it multiply it by 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 this because uh, so it is nonlinear, so it is L, which is some some strange thing uh, with res L with respect to its argument. Um, Okay, and so the some some uh, quick list of short cards cuts uh, the gradient of uh, log p uh, is uh, equal to the gradient sum of gradients. Uh, sorry, gradient of sum of sum uh, equals to the sum of gradients uh, for. Something that is linear over x, it is equal to the following. If it's linear over w, so it is equal to this thing. And uh, for sigmoid function, the gradient is the following. And it, it works for any kind of x, which could be a scalar vector matrix or a tensor. Um, and, and uh, let me now make a quick detour uh, from these slides. I wanted to show you uh, a few things from the course I, I mentioned before. I, I've uh, shown you part of it during the first day. Uh, which is um, here, and I will paste the link uh, to the chat now. Where is, Where is this? Uh, So some strange reason for me, chat is disabled here. Uh, OK, I'll, I'll share it with you later on. So um, it is a, it is a course that, that we've been working on uh, recently, and, and it has uh, a special topic that is um, devoted to optimization approaches. So it covers uh, gradient descent, it can, ca covers uh, Newton's method of sec taking into account second derivative and, and uh, optimization of a function and optimization approximation of a function and simulation uh, approximation. So and uh, here we have, uh, as I shown you on the first day, Uh, some nice visualization. I'm just uh, as, uh, answering uh, random uh, questions randomly. So it has some visualization how gradient descent actually works. Uh, It, uh, it, it, it has some questions that, that uh, are meaningful if you want to check if you really understand uh, 
what's going on. I mean, understand how gradient descent actually works and what happens inside machine uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so, so it's um, uh, good for you to uh, to, to try. Uh, but I wanted to show you. I don't know. Yeah, so this is this was one of visualization how this gradient descent works and how uh, how to compute the gradient and uh, yeah probably we, we come back uh, here a bit later because it uh, also covers topic we didn't touch yet uh, like the advanced optimization technique for for the gradient descent but for the moment probably uh, those, those visualization uh, are uh, admirable and and uh, it's nice to switch from the uh, pure math formula that we had before. So um, for historical reasons, uh, those building blocks that uh, we discussed now somehow associated with uh, data processing units uh, that work in in heads of organi organical and uh, organical entities, organical uh, uh, organism and and uh, for some reason uh, also I would call those historical without going into more details um, people thought that due, due to this data processing we can capture some some consciousness properties or, or properties that uh, allows more more primitive organism to communicate and to survive eventually. Unfortunately, uh, such formalism does not answer the question about the consciousness in general, uh, but but still the, the title neural network has been coined uh, by <clears throat> uh, has been coined by researchers and uh, it's still uh, quite popular nowadays, although no traces of back propagation has been found in a living organism whatsoever. So uh, it's, it's just a jargon that uh, to me is a little bit uh, vague and, and doesn't add much <coughs> because uh, this linear algebra thing uh, is, is um, much more clear and, and gives better understanding what, what happens uh, and then thinking about the transformation of the vector with respect to uh, some kinds of linear algebra transformation is much more Mm. straightforward than, than thinking about spikes and, and connections and uh, axons and, and neurons and, and stuff like this. But anyway, um, the, those uh, things are called by ne neural networks and neural networks consist of uh, building blocks that are called layers. And so far we looked at two kinds of layers, which is a dense layer and non-linearity layer. Uh, so dense layer or linear layer, it is the same thing. It does, it takes input, multiplies by um, some weight and adds a bias and, and passes to the next layer. Or non-linearity layer, which is essentially 
uh, one of the <coughs> uh, nonlinear function on top of uh, that can sit on top of dense layer. Also, we uh, have input layer, which is essentially a vector of inputs, so it is a identical transform. An output layer that just uh, gives the output to something sitting outside of the neural network. And uh, we also have to understand what is activation uh, in, 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 the, in those two examples of dense layer and nonlinearity layer. It is output that is computed by uh, applying those weights or applying this nonlinear function on top of the input. Uh, so it is activation of the layer. And uh, the word called uh, the word backpropagation is uh, uh, just a fancy word for mathematical chain rule. And uh, if we have a neural network, uh, we uh, often say that we train this neural network using a backprop. So weights of the internal uh, layer or hidden layer, as uh, those are called, are uh, computed by the chain rule and, and uh, taking uh, derivatives or taking uh, the value of the loss function at specific point. So uh, how do we train uh, such an architecture where instead of one hidden layer, we have two hidden layers? What is your guess here? What method should we use? But preparation too. Yeah, yeah. So of course Monte Carlo uh, could work here as well, but better stick with uh, more efficient ones. Okay. So uh, what kind of potential problems uh, we can? Uh, have if we add many, many layers uh, with many, many uh, weights or big uh, matrices of weights, uh, it, it would be easy to overfit. Also, there is no good theory that explains uh, why those methods, why those models are so powerful and basically we are pretty much like ancient uh, at the time of ancient Greek scientists uh, trying to figure out how uh, planets rotate around Earth and uh, suggesting different hypotheses uh, why uh, some planets do some retrograde movements from time to time, so adding more and more complications to the models. Uh, so things that I, I've described, of course, they are looking straightforward, but they uh, do not explain why uh, big, heavy architectures actually converge to uh, a minimum that is comparable to the human level recognition. Uh, so there is no golden standard. Or, 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 or some golden rule for building an architecture. And it's pretty much empirical uh, science where you have to look at different sources of information and uh, see what papers people have written about problems similar to yours, understand why they came up with certain architecture and why, um, on which cases does it work. and understand but if your case fits into the class of cases that can be solved by this architecture and and hope that it will be uh, successful and and then ex explore yourself so it is pretty much trial and error so of course there is certain expertise and and people uh, doing this stuff regularly they more or less know how uh, those networks should be built for a specific problem or uh, what 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 could be done and uh, what uh, was done and didn't work. 
So it is kind of oracle, uh, oracle kind of knowledge. And of course, those uh, training of those networks is computationally heavy if your network uh, becomes uh, becomes uh, quite extensive. And so if you work with images, and in image, uh, every pixel is a dimension. In case of tabular data, it's a little bit simpler. But, but still, uh, if you have a lot of data, things might be complicated. OK, so uh, let's uh, see if we can, can have a look at this demo. It is uh, a neural network uh, that works in your browser, inside your browser. Uh, so it is a JavaScript uh, implementation of backpropagation. So you can play with different data. Uh, you see it on the right and, and, the, and different network architectures. So you can add uh, or remove uh, hidden layers. So now I have two hidden layers and uh, those neurons are connected uh, to, to everything to everything. And um, you see that colors of these um, uh, neurons correspond to the parameters that, that this neuron is able to learn. So you see that there are two, uh, two inputs so every neuron here is a two-dimensional thing. Uh, so, so it tries to build uh, a two-dimensional, so it, it, it has to learn uh, two coefficients. That can be re represented as a decision surface here. And, and, and if we fly over uh, uh, with our cursor of the neuron, so we see this decision surface. So we see that uh, currently it, it is not trained, it's just a random. Uh, configuration. And uh, we can play with different parameters uh, like learning rate, like kind of activation function and kind of regularization. Uh, and and, and uh, we can choose between classification and regression here. And if we can, uh, if we start uh, the training, so we, we see how the decision surface changes of the epochs. So far we've run 115 epochs, and you see that uh, our neurons are getting the, cap capturing the uh, differences uh, between points, and it tries to shape into uh, the right direction. And uh, here you see the training and testing losses. So you, you can estimate degree of overfit, etc. And uh, you can you can also experiment with different uh, parameters like adding noise uh, to the data, so make shaking the the position of points and other stuff. So I I would recommend you to. Uh, spend some time playing with this uh, thing. Uh, I believe the, the the slides are in the Indico, uh, and uh, of course you can click on the link there and get uh, to this playground of TensorFlow yourself. Okay, uh, and all this, all all this training is happening by means of back propagation. So there is nothing magical happening. And uh, back propagation is based on computing uh, derivatives, and derivatives are needed to do an, a step in the gradient descent. So the question is, as as you remember from the uh, demonstration of how different points behaved on, uh, on 
it's on, on not so curved shape, so they become slow. Can we can we do something to improve the convergence speed of this of, of this uh, algorithm? So um, of course we can uh, add second derivative. Uh, it would it would uh, significantly speed up things. Uh, so it is an illustration for gradient descent. Uh, we we just go uh, doing uh, doing uh, small steps around uh, this gradient change. And uh, if we take a second order derivative uh, using Newton method, uh, we can be much more straightforward. Unfortunately. Um, uh, so we have to we have to compute this Haitian matrix. So maybe it's not that big. <laughs> well, of course, if we have uh, if we have uh, thousand dimensional thousand dimensional input, so this this matrix would be million elements. So the, in, instead of computing uh, computing so sorry, no, it, 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 is, it is computing with respect to weight. So if we had thousand, uh, thousand different weights we have to estimate, Haitian matrix would be million elements. Million, million elements is, 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 is a lot, so it is quadratic. And also uh, we would have to uh, invert this matrix. So inverting matrices is also quite an expensive uh, procedure. So million element would be much more complicated than, than computing even <clears throat> thousand steps uh, or using just regular gradient descent. So as you, also you remember, uh, we uh, can can simplify computation by computing stochastically gradient descent by uh, individual elements in our sample. So we uh, move in much more random order, sometimes even away from uh, the target, but still uh, it, 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 in, in the uh, limited converges to the target of our uh, of our function to the to the minimum <clears throat> and another idea that can simplify computations and speed up uh, that the descent is uh, idea of adding momentums uh, so we can can uh, think of inertia, inertia that happens in the physical world. Uh, in, instead of just computing a gradient, we also compute velocity. So velocity is uh, something that uh, that doesn't uh, change with the uh, with the change of the slope. So we can. Uh, continue slide along the uh, shallow slope uh, if we had a good uh, momentum before. And and uh, here we see how uh, how the formula works. So it is uh, some some uh, rough uh, mathematical uh, data science approximation of motion with momentum. And uh, also, yes, we can reuse computational gradients uh, from the previous uh, step. And uh, here is the illustration uh, how how it actually works. So let's see if we can get to the demo page. Um, so. It shows how, uh, from the starting point that we can choose, a 
and uh, here is a very shallow part, so, sorry, shallow part along this line and, and uh, kind of uh, hilly or da downside, downside uh, part over here. Uh, and, and, and you see how the trajectory changes yeah, with different parameters of the uh, momentum enabled gradient descent. So with alpha, I can, with bigger alpha, uh, and, and yes, and we have a uh, certain number of iteration uh, or certain stopping condition. So we, we end up uh, either after a certain number of steps or when the decrease of the uh, function uh, becomes too small to be noticeable. So you see that with increasing alpha allow you to get a little closer, but but you see that in the beginning you you your steps are quite um, shaky. And with increase of momentum, you also uh, can 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 get a weird trajectories here. But but anyway, it is uh, getting pretty close to the uh, optimal solution. And you see that uh, those parameters have to be defined by your by yourself. It is not something that that is given by the problem. It is something you have to figure out and uh, choose correctly. Uh, otherwise, your your solution might be uh, pretty close, but not not exactly. So let's see if uh, there are other interactive uh, visualization here. Yeah, I would recommend you to explore um, this uh, this uh, paper a bit. So it it, it uh, goes into details uh, how properties of gradient descent uh, depends on on different parameters. What kind of regimes uh, you can find? Uh, it is not like the ultimate answer uh, about gradient descent, but it gives you a little bit of intuition. Uh, that, that helps you to figure out uh, the properties of a neural network. Uh, and th this um, I know it's something different. So it's about colorization. So, uh, if you if you uh, choose to uh, to use optimizers that uh, imply momentum, you have to be careful about what what uh, parameters you give to this optimizer. And, and usually, it's worth playing with different values to see how far your neural network can get during the training. So let's get back to the slides. Another idea that is also popular uh, that, that allows us to speed up training is uh, called RMS prop. So the idea is to adapt learning rate to the slope of objective function. So with large gradient, it goes slower. Uh, with small gradient, it goes faster. So it uh, ad 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 adapts, uh, adjusts uh, the step using this this coefficient, 
this term. Oops. Yeah, so it is a moving average uh, norm squared. And um, so it, it um, does exactly what, what is written here in plain language. So just the speed of the uh, of the of the iteration, the size of the iteration with respect to the slope. And another idea uh, is called Adam. So it combines momentum with RMS prop in a single method. And uh, for for TensorFlow, it is uh, like default choice of optimizer. It is. Uh, it is described in uh, the paper you have link here. And uh, so let's uh, here uh, ex ex uh, see comparison of different uh, gradient descents on, on, on this shape, on this uh, function landscape. So you see uh, that the fastest one is the blue, which is uh, Nesterov and the next one is purple, which is uh, RMS probe. And, and notice uh, that this uh, purple starts uh, starts shaking quite furiously when when it gets very close to the destination. It happens because. Uh, the, 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 it, it tries to keep the speed constant and the slope there becomes really low. So it, try, it, it increases the step quite significantly. Um, okay. Um, things that uh, there are, there are many others. Uh, algorithms uh, has been developed and uh, it is quite an area of research and people try to beat um, those states of the art. So every now and then uh, we can we, we see different algorithms that uh, claim that they do better than the state of the art. So there are first order uh, algorithms uh, and the second order algor algorithms that, that somehow approximate Haitian with some clever heuristics. Um, and and if, if you're using if you're using frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow, it, it is quite easy and natural to uh, choose between those, uh, although there is no good uh, golden rule, uh, which one should do better than the other. So you have to experiment yourself. Um, okay, so uh, another important thing uh, before we stop theoretical part uh, is initialization of the uh, weights of the neural network. So, what do you think will happen if we start from our we, we start our uh, gradient descent uh, with point equal to zero, with uh, where weights are equal to zero? Uh, Well, it, it, it will um, result in the in the symmetrical outputs uh, from since all hidden hidden layers hidden layer units connected to all input units um, depicted by by the those lines. Uh, so it means that output of those uh, will also be identical and. 
it, it means that uh, derivative that we compute will be derivative of the loss function that we compute will also be identical. And, and it means that uh, we essentially reduce the dimension of our neural network or, or this hidden layer to a single element. Uh, to, to deal with this problem, um, we have to break the symmetry and we, we, we initialize it with uh, some random numbers. And <laughs> there are uh, different techniques that uh, depend on uh, the data that you're trying to, 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 to analyze, a problem you're trying to solve, and there are different uh, ways how you can do this initialization. So, uh, um, good guess would be uh, just uniform distribution, or it could be a, a normal distribution uh, around zero. So, all, all those weights are centered around zeros, or distribution centered around zero. And um, for some cases, uh, it is better to use uniform. For some cases, it is better to, to use normal. And more details uh, you can find in this uh, following this link. OK, so um, this, this um, is the first part I wanted to cover that lays down the foundation for uh, the, the more complicated neural network design that you have to play uh, dur during this course, right? So we uh, consider it uh, individual building blocks. We consider it stacking as a way to combine those building blocks and backpropagation that allows to change parameters of those building blocks in consistent way. So unlike, unlike um, we did it yesterday with two algorithms stacked on, on top of each other, when we trained one and, and, and stored the output for, uh, for the second one and then trained the second one, here we train those blocks all together in a single pipeline. And uh, due to that, you can build pretty complicated pipelines. So, and, and here is the uh, example uh, example of uh, inception neural network designed by Google uh, some time ago already. So maybe three or four years old, or maybe even more. And then you see it. It. it uh, Consists of different kind of building blocks. Every building, every 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 uh, box here is it's not a neuron; it's a layer, and 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 they can be uh, quite quite uh, heavy. Uh, so computing those derivatives by hand is really complicated. Uh, to to save you from this, uh, there are plenty of uh, plenty. Okay, several uh, deep learning frameworks that uh, has been around for a while and allow you to encode architecture of the neural network in a uh, simple human readable, human writable way. Uh, so it, it is e even um, one of the languages or some special lang languages like Python or uh, C sharp or uh, Java, or you can you can write it even in JSON. And uh, those frameworks wrap uh, all the stack from the hardware uh, to the uh, software language to the language of your choice uh, using quite sophisticated piece of, pieces of software uh, because it has to be able to run. On FPG, on on well, FPGA is a little bit outli outlier here because it still uh, demands some special efforts uh, to, to to run uh, architectures. Uh, but 
for GPU, TPU, and, and CPU, uh, it is quite possible to use a single framework that would be able to map uh, your code written uh, either, either here uh, on, on this level or, 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 or somewhere here uh, using TensorFlow Torch down to the hardware and, and do this in efficient way. So, um, there are um, uh, two layers or two uh, software layers uh, that allow you to play with uh, Mm, configuration of neural networks and define it in pretty high level way. Uh, so either you uh, define it as a as a graph by by hands, and TensorFlow allows allows you to, to do this, or you can define it uh, using a higher level primitives like uh, that, that that takes into account all the details of implementation of different kinds of layers, and you just say, I want layer this, and I, I, and I would la want layer that. Uh, so basically, you're either sitting on, on, the, on this top level definition, or you, you're sitting uh, here, and, and uh, this Cafe Theano uh, level allows you to define, uh, define the procedures that that happens uh, in the forward propagation of the signal and uh, automatically compute the backward propagation. So, so most of the time, of course, you're going to design neural network in those two blocks. I mean, sitting on in 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 the frameworks uh, of those two levels. But uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, some some building blocks of those frameworks. Uh, so the the most basic one is a layer. Uh, so we start with inputs to the layer. Those. Uh, X and Y, which are actually activations coming from the layer before. So we have to think of something that's sitting in front of our layer or input layer. Um, and and, and um, it is a forward computation of an output or further activation. So in our case, Z is a function of X and Y, and uh, we take X and Y and we compute Z. And uh, red lines are backward propagation of the, of the error that uh, we get from the upper level. And we compute uh, gradients with respect to the activation that, that, that uh, parameters of activation that we uh, compute that, that we get. So we adjust parameters here and uh, propagate the error further down to the previous layers of our network architecture. So and it happens behind the scenes. It happens automatically by the framework. We just have to define how the network should be organized. So you see, uh, it is an example of Cafe network definition. Uh, it is a popular architecture, Lenet uh, by Jan Lecun, I guess, or his colleagues. Uh, so it has uh, a layer definition uh, that has some parameters uh, and, and parameters for 
um, it's a learning rate multiplier, so you can specify how fast uh, this um, gradient descent with respect to parameters of the, of the layer should work for this particular layer. So, uh, and also parameters of numbers of output channels, uh, size of the kernel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, here we do not define any uh, forward rule. We just uh, define the neural network architecture, and then we call a common uh, cafe train and uh, specify the name of the file that contains the network definition. And of course, a data set on which we want to train it. So it is uh, written in C++ and so it is very easy to deploy. And there are uh, many different models already pre-trained so you can pick from this and uh, do whatever you want. Uh, but adding uh, more layers is quite difficult because you have to write it in C++. And debugging it, it's uh, also quite expensive. Uh, so another building block of a, a framework is called computation graph. Maybe it's not a building block, it's something that uh, sits underneath every framework. Uh, but anyway, so let's uh, look at simple example. If we want to compute C here, so we have to compute B first, and for B we have to compute a first and uh, given the input x y z uh, we have to perform uh, the following graph of operations so we multiply x by y and then we save it into a then we add z and uh, we we get b and then we sum all elements and we get c uh, and the 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 Frameworks, some frameworks like TensorFlow and, and Theano allow you to define those graphs explicitly. So you define the forward uh, graph computation and gradients are computed using chain rule automatically. Uh, and, and with this uh, definition, with this um, building blocks, it is easy to define new kind of layers. And uh, we can optimize uh, the graph uh, using regular um, gradient descent approach. So if, we, if there are some parameters, we can, che we can check, uh, we can uh, update weights of those parameters. Uh, and and, and it, it becomes quite efficient. Although, uh, if, if this graph is static, it may be too restrictive, so it would require you, uh, if, if you want, for example, your neural network to change architecture depending on the input, it would be impossible to implement on, on earlier versions of TenderFlow. Now it is, now it does in version two point something, it does support uh, dynamic graphs and it uh, much, uh, much, uh, easier and closer to PyTorch. And uh, in PyTorch, when we write uh, a Python code uh, and execute this code, uh, we actually define the network architecture. So it is uh, quite different from graphs approach. Uh, instead of uh, Instead of defining a special entity uh, with um, more or less uh, imperative approach, we just write the code, the Python code that gets transformed into uh, the graph behind the scene that we even do not know that this graph actually exists. And it changes if we change the code. So if for some reason we uh, change the computation of the output of the neural network graphs, graph will update accordingly. Uh, TensorFlow 2.0 uh, and then 2.1 are 
no, the, the latest one uh, supports this as well. So it's not much different from uh, PyTorch now, but for historical reason, it was uh, introduced in Chainer, Dynet, and PyTorch. Uh, this is pretty much it. Uh, so in, in this short overview, we, we covered some of the frameworks that uh, exist out there, what kind of building blocks uh, you can you can use to define a network. And uh, in the practical part of today's session, we're going to uh, play with PyTorch a little bit. So uh, I would suggest we take a break for uh, 15 plus minutes. Maybe we reconvene again around 10 to 11. Uh, yeah, of course, if you if you have questions now, uh, let, let's discuss them. I have a question. So, um, well, one of the things I that surprised me or confused me a bit when I started playing with neural um, networks is the fact that you have so many options for doing the gradient descent. I even remember looking at books uh, where you know one specific, for instance, I remember Adam used to be recommended, but but then looking at the, the most recent version of, of the same book, then Adam is not recommended anymore. For instance, uh, so you have would you have a specific recommendation or? Uh, so, uh, specific recommendation is uh, to do hyperparameter search. So, um, it also depends on the, on the type of problems. So, if you're dealing with Im images, uh, then maybe one of the fancier examples I mentioned in the slide before uh, would be would be better. Uh, if you're dealing with tabular data, maybe you don't need this because uh, you would not have uh, that shallow regions. And, and uh, in, in case of tabular data, and by the way, there are special architectures uh, that has been designed recently, and they outperform state-of-the-art gradient descent boosted gradient descent boosting decision algorithms. Um, so it's it's pretty much living thing. So without experiments, it's uh, without experiments and without access to um, like recent knowledge uh, or or people that try to solve particular kinds of problems with neural networks, it, it is of course very easy to. Uh, to be suboptimal. Well, of course, the, the even, even if you spend time reading papers, you 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 you, you are not uh, guaranteed to 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 get to the optimum. So it is okay. This was my feeling too, but it's nice to hear from an expert. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. I, I have another question. Uh, I didn't get what is the difference between the PyTorch and TensorFlow implementation because, because for me it seems the same. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was different uh, maybe a year ago. Uh, so TensorFlow didn't support dynamic graphs, and now it does. Uh, and and uh, the main difference is TensorFlow is Google and PyTorch is Facebook. <laughs> and, and also, it is matter of uh, matter of uh, taste. So the, the the code is written in a, li in a little bit different fashion. Uh, I'm I'm more uh, used to PyTorch. Uh, but uh, I know many people that do not like PyTorch with, with no objective uh, 
with no objective claims. So it's it's a matter of taste. Uh, essentially, they are, they are um, the same. I would say. An another question is: uh, uh, Could you explain what is the dropout technique? Um, yeah, uh, so I think, uh, no, I, I don't have this in uh, this bunch of slides. But let me open another bunch. So essentially, it is uh, the way how you can uh, regularize a neural network from overfitting. Uh, you remember that in, in case of uh, linear regression, uh, logistic regression, um, uh, wait a second. <laughs> Sorry, I have to I have to answer this this call and then be be right back in a. Sorry about that. So remember uh, that for uh, linear logistic regression, uh, when you have too many parameters, it is it is quite easy uh, it, to overfit your data and uh, to, to pick some peculiarities that are uh, not due to the distribution that you want to be able to recognize, but uh, due to uh, some noise introduced either by our uh, data collect data collecting device or data collecting procedure, or just noise coming from the data. So, uh, in terms of neural network, there is of course a similar technique that you can apply. So you can add regularization uh, on on top of the uh weights so you can just add no l l2 norm to the uh, loss function and you demand that it, it should be it, it should not get too large so it is very similar uh to l2 uh, or l1 regularization that we used for logistic regression but uh, since we uh, are in the field of neural nets um, it is also possible to regularize it just by randomly resetting weights of the neurons of the of the given layer of the next layer. So and and and, and dropout is essentially uh, uh, the, these kind of procedures. So you just randomly drop reset weights. Of the neuron of the of the neurons of the following layer, uh, and given the parameter of this dropout layer, like probability at, at which you drop uh, the up uh, downstream weights. I, unfortunately, I cannot find this uh, this slide uh, this slide deck right now. Maybe ah, wait a second. Um, 
No, no, it's different. Okay, but uh, essentially it is what I what I said. So if you have uh, uh, a dropout layer, it means that the following layer is uh, randomly dropping weights. Uh, by dropping, I mean resetting to a random value or to zero. OK, then, uh, so uh, thank you for uh, listening. Now let's uh, make a short break and then we uh, come back. Well, maybe not 10 to 12, but around 12, right? Oh, sorry, yeah, not, not, not 12. In, in, in your case, it would be 11. Yeah, for us, 11. Yeah. OK, so uh, see you soon. Bye bye. GitHub page in Google Collab. Let me share my screen. Um, so please let me know if you are able to open it as well. Um, just somehow either in the chat or by raising your hand ah, there is chat chat is not available for me uh, for some reason uh, yeah uh, I see one hand. Two hands. Three, four, oh, very nice. Oh, it works. OK, so in, uh, this uh, notebook will um, explain some of the. Some of the details, some of the basics of PyTorch. Uh, so in, in the first cell, uh, we just download um, some Python notebook that we're going to use later on. Sorry, Python code that we're going to use later on. Uh, at the moment, it doesn't. It is not important. Uh, so we uh, just can continue to the next next cell that uh, imports PyTorch and and shows uh, version of it. One point five, very nice. And first, at first, we compare PyTorch with NumPy. It has very similar syntax and it was intentional so uh, people could people could uh, code in pytorch in a similar way as they do it in numpy although there are some differences that that may at first be pretty annoying um, you would probably you would notice uh, it is from the from the first place but over the time, when you switch from NumPy to, to PyTorch and back, uh, it's uh, it's um, might be a, a nightmare. OK, anyway, so you see in NumPy, uh, what, what we do here is um, we just do some basic 
operations, uh, computing um, dot product of two vectors, computing cumulative sum, com computing mean value along uh, axis, uh, some axis of uh, uh, metrics, etc. In PyTorch, it is uh, pretty much the same, although although um, Uh, you you notice differences. So instead of dot, it, it, it you, you call matmul, or you can also call mm matrix matrix multiplication. Instead of axis, you specify dim, uh, which which stands for dimension. And uh, Here probably you doesn't don't notice any any much any much more difference, but uh, uh, also you see how you create a PyTorch object. So you pass a NumPy tensor to constructor of tensor uh, in PyTorch. So torch tensor is a similar thing to NumPy array. And it is very easy to create a tensor from the uh, from the NumPy, and also it is possible to transform transform uh, tensor from PyTorch to NumPy. It is performed by a function just like this. Uh, so you see you get uh, here you have a tensor and then here you have an uh, NumPy array. OK, so. Uh, some. Examples uh, of the code. Uh, that that do see, does similar thing, so instead of. Uh, Passing, passing uh, a tuple of of some dimensions or some some arguments uh, in in PyTorch, um, those are just arguments like individual arguments. So the, the function takes star args and and and, and uh, you have to pass it like this. Um, then you have to change, go from axis to dim. Uh, notation of types may be a little bit different. So instead of in 64, uh, you uh, have to type torch, ty torch types, like long tensor. And uh, for for your for your uh, Convenience. There is a table that shows the interlink or some some connections between PyTorch and NumPy primitives. Uh, let me open it. So you see different types. How those are mapped between those two worlds? Uh, you see that <clears throat> some constructors like uh, tensors. Uh, they, they have similar names, but arguments, as I mentioned, uh, passed a little bit differently. Um, for some uh, for some elements, there is no uh, corresponding for some function. There is no corresponding function in PyTorch. But OK, so there are some differences, but still they are pretty much similar, much more similar than NumPy and, and TensorFlow. Uh, so and and um, you write everything in, in Python and it is also quite a bit of convenience. So let's uh, take a uh, further step to a practical example. So uh, we want to implement those 
uh, x and y function, so we could plot a two dimensional function. Uh, so the goal is to write this function t minus uh, I just uh, repeat what is written uh, in the cell below. So <clears throat> and uh, in the end we get some uh, not plot. So and depending on the uh, depending on the ratio uh, of those frequencies, uh, you you get quite different different pictures in the end. Okay, so it was um, easy. Now let's. Um, see how automatic gradient calculation happens. So in Torch it happens with Autograd module and the general pipeline in, in which you, you know, define a neural network uh, works like this. Uh, so you um, create all your um, all your tensors that you want to tune with a special with a special argument requires gradient equal to like like this example. Then we define some function, differentiable function that this uh, that includes this uh, tensor that you have just created. And after you call this function, uh, you can call loss dot backward, so it is automatic method that uh, that that exists for every function that you define. So you, you, it's an arbitrary function, and you can call dot backward of this uh, object that you have created, and all the gradients with respect to tensors that you 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 involved in the computation in this function will be available as a property of this uh, sorry all the gradients will be available as the properties of those tensors so let's uh, take a look and at, at the example so we have a data set uh, it is a boston rent boston houses rent uh, data set Uh, so we just just uh, see how the price changes with, or maybe it's not the price. Uh, it's, it's it's a price depending on some of some of the parameter, the final parameter. It doesn't matter which one actually. And then uh, we can rewrite the gradient descent by a very simple pieces of code. So in uh, first we define uh, two uh, elements that we want to fit into the data, two one-dimensional objects W and B. Uh, and and, and uh, okay, we down we uh, put the data set in X and Y, and then we define uh, that we want to compute uh, Y pred predictions given this formula. And then we want to compute the mean squared error, so which is essentially a difference between y red and y. And you see that behind the scene, now we in, inside the loss, we have encoded w and b. And after after this call, we can call loss dot backward 
which would compute the gradients and gradients are stored in the appropriate properties of our tensors. So, so it's, uh, it's how this magic uh, actually works. Um, Uh, you should notice um, now the following. So the gradients that are stored in those properties are additive. So you see, I call this piece of code once again. And and uh, after, after that, uh, nothing has changed. X and Y are still the same. But you see that the gradients, uh, or at least the values that are stored in those properties, has increased, so it's now minus 94. If I do it again, like this, uh, it, it has increased once again. So it, it, it is a, an additive value uh, that, that is used for computing the gradients for some complicated structure that uh, maybe uh, goes through the same weight more than once uh, to, to compute some kind of loops maybe. Uh, but it is the key, it is how it works. Uh, it means that uh, when we want to compute the gradient in a simple cases, we have to zero it at every iteration. So that's that's what we do here. So here is the code that trains the uh, our simple linear regression uh, through 100 iterations. And and what we do here is is we compute uh, predictions, and then we compute the loss, and uh, then we compute the uh, backward, and then we change the the uh, value of our coefficients by subtracting the gradient step values. So this is how we how we compute the gradient. And after that, we have to zero values of the gradient for the reason I mentioned before. Uh, so so we do not compute it many 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 times uh, over a dollar. And uh, every five steps of this iteration, we plot uh, how this how this data, how our decision rule is visualized. So let's see how how it trains. Starts from a random position and uh, gradually changes to the uh, slope that minimizes mean squared error in to our data. OK, so when, when you have time, uh, you can uh, improve your regression by adding uh, quadratic or cubic terms. Uh, so to, to shape this orange line a bit nicer into the data set. But OK, let's uh, move a little bit further. Uh, so we uh, load the module that we get uh, at the beginning of this notebook. It is essentially a data set that contains digits. Uh, and you, you remember uh, you remember uh, MNIST is a popular data set that contains hand, handwritten digits um, and not MNIST is a data set that contains letters just for uh, diversity sake and we pick letters a and b those would be class a and class b and uh, our data set is uh, essentially a set of matrices like two, two mm, thousand eight hundred matrices in total uh, every 
image is 20, 28 by 28. And those are two examples of A and B letters from, from this data set. If we change it uh, say to plus 10, we can look at other examples. <clears throat> OK, so. Now let's. Um, look at the definition of the neural network, so there are, there are two main. Uh, main ways how you can define a neural network in PyTorch. Uh, the first one is more object oriented, so if you're a fan of. Um, defining defining classes and, and uh, methods, uh, then maybe it's more appealing. Of course, it is much more flexible because using those methods, you can uh, define some, uh, some non-trivial logic happening inside your network. Um, so here is the example how you can define a simple neural network that consists of uh, two layers. Uh, parameters of those two layers are hand, uh, sorry, are hardwired uh, in in the constructor of the of this class. And when we um, when we uh, want to calculate forward direction, uh, transform uh, input data into the output data. It happens in the method that is called forward. So it takes the argument as an input and, and you define what happens then. So you see the argument passes through the first layer, then you add some nonlinearity. Uh, afterward, it is uh, goes afterward it goes for the second layer then one more non-linearity function, and this is something you return. Basically, those two methods, uh, initial one, uh, the constructor and the forward, are required to make your neural network working. And of course, you have to inherit your class from uh, the basic building block of Tensor of uh, PyTorch that is called NN.module. It sits in the namespace torch.nn. Um, and and um, there is another uh, another simple way to define a neural network that is um, alternative to the one mentioned before. It is like a building a, a pipeline out of blocks. Um, so you start with a neural network that uh, start off from the sequential container uh, that stacks layers on top of each other. So then you uh, say that you want to add a linear layer like this that takes vector of uh, 70. Uh, so, sorry, sorry. There are se uh, 784 weights. So it, it, since it is linear, it means that uh, it, it, it expects to get vector of that dimension. And then you say uh, output of this layer should be equal to vector of size one. So it, it should be a scalar. There are other arguments that you can pass to a linear uh, to, the, to the linear uh, constructor. Uh, like you can specify if you want to use bias term or not, and uh, others I, I, I usually do not use. Some reason, auto completion is not helping much 
uh, here, but okay, it, it, it doesn't matter. So afterward, after uh, adding this model, you put another model on top of it. So we call it L2 and uh, we, we say it, it should be sigmoid. And then we can examine uh, what are the parameters of our model. Uh, so we run this. It seems like I've forgotten to. Uh, and that's probably was the reason why. Out of completion. And IntelliSense didn't work, yes. Now uh, you see, yeah, the bias uh, is an attribute and, and bias also is an argument. So if you set bias to uh, false, uh, you do not add a bias term. It may be meaningful if you know that <coughs> input data, input signal is uh, centered around zero. But if, if you're not sure about it, um, you, you'd better leave it by default and by default bias term is there. OK, so uh, you see that uh, parameters that are there in, in my model, uh, it is a vector of 784 values and a scalar. So it is a torch of size one. And uh, if, we, if, I, if I remove, uh, sorry, if I add bias uh, false, here, so which means I, I uh, do not use bias here. Uh, the, the parameters of my network would just contain a vector of you know, 784 elements. I prefer to uh, stick with the bias because bias term because uh, uh, I do not have any prior knowledge about the distribution in, in my data. Better we learn it. Uh, so we create a dummy data set of three, three samples and uh, 784 features. So just uh, selecting first three elements and X and Y. And um, when we want to compute the output of our model given given the uh, given the set of vectors we uh, just call passing it as an argument to the object that we have created so it is maybe not very um, intuitive i mean sorry maybe not very strict from the Mm. Python language point to you, but but Python language does allow such construct. So we uh, calling uh, a method like default method of the object with, that we have created, and um, so we can take a look at the predictions of this randomly initialized network. So th th this is the output. Now uh, let's um, define a loss function that would allow you to, to train this network using backpropagation. In the following in the following cell, so here you have the uh, definition of the negative uh, uh, negative logarithmic likelihood or cross entropy function that you have to rewrite in PyTorch using uh, torch and n functional, which is uh, imported as a as f as f namespace here. So 
please take a few moments or minutes uh, to write this code here. And, uh, if you have questions, meanwhile, feel free to ask. And uh, please uh, raise your hand if uh, you manage to uh, execute this cell without assertion errors. Okay, so Eric uh, has managed to do this. It means we also can. So uh, we have to uh, substitute this log uh, p um, of conditional probability y i given x i with the predictions that 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 our model has. So it is essentially, um, and and uh, it, it is a component written form, but uh, we have already uh, vectors uh, that that uh, we can use. That's why we can rewrite it a little bit simpler. 
So we have y, and uh, we want to multiply by y red plus one minus y multiplied by, uh, sorry, logarithm. Maybe just torch logarithm. Yes. Uh, ah, sorry. We don't have to use an n functional yet. In in an n functional, we have already uh, already defined uh, cross entropy, of course. So uh, coming back here, torch log one minus. So and, and it, it's it's oops it's already gives us uh, sum over uh, all elements. So now I have to take a mean value of this sum, and and loss is uh, minus equals minus cross entropy. So let, let it, it, also you have a set of assertions here that, that will not allow me to write something weird. Uh, so let's see where we uh, where we fail. Uh, I think it's white predicted, not widespread. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Uh, so it says that cross entropy must be a vector with element uh, per sample. Um, so it is um, in, in in our case we computed uh, computed it uh, uh, mean to 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 fast so uh, Yeah, now now it passes uh, all the tests. So cross entropy is just uh, a vector element, vector uh, of the same size uh, of our sample, and and loss is uh, average or mean with minus sign in front of it. Uh, okay, so in, inside uh, this um, namespace torch and then functional, uh, there is also implementation of the cross entropy loss function. Uh, so in, uh, in, it, it operates on, uh, on a row output of log it function instead of probabilities. It doesn't, it, it's not much difference, but good to know. OK, next thing, after we manage to compute those, those uh, loss function, we have to adjust the weights of our matrices accordingly. Uh, we can do it like we did previously with the loop by hand, examining uh, dot grad properties, but uh, of course there are smarter, smarter way to do this. Uh, essentially, those algorithms are optimizers that we've been talking during the lecture, and they can uh, range in big. Uh, 
diversity. Uh, so if we if you look at the various classes defined in Torch Optim namespace, you you would see that there are quite a bit of them. Uh, you see, you see uh, one well, first uh, first degree of sorry first uh, order uh, gradients and and uh, also second order gradient LBMJS. So uh, with with pick RMS probe, just just for example. Uh, and we have to pass all the parameters that we want this optimizer to change uh, during the gradient descent. And uh, and here is a parameter that we pass to this optimizer. It is a learning rate. And also, uh, you see, you can take alpha, epsilon, weight decay, momentum, etc., etc. So there is a Link to the paper uh, that describes uh, how how it works and uh, more um, maybe concise description of individual parameters. Um, and it it can be used uh, in the following way. So after you compute the loss backward, it means that after this call all the elements in our model have dot grad values in it. And, and what this method does, it takes those values and adjusts properties of those uh, tensors, weights of these tensors themselves accordingly. It, it happens inside, uh, inside this step, opt dot step. And then we have to clear gradients ourselves. I wonder if uh, they added uh, any parameters to this function that would that would clear clear uh, the gradients for me. But it seems it seems there is nothing. Okay, so we clear it, and then. we have to put it all together. So we remove all those objects, uh, just not to interfere with uh, some things that we have uh, miswritten, maybe. And now we have to start from the scratch. So we create a model that uh, contains two, uh, two building blocks, like linear and sigmoid, and uh, we define and optimizers with a learning rate equal one to minus uh, one, 10 to the minus third degree, uh, sorry, 10 to minus third power. And uh, now we have to define the main optimization cycle. And basically what, what we need to do is just copy paste uh, the code from the cells above. So how do we compute predicted value? Uh, how do we uh, strange? How do we compute the loss uh, function? How do we compute the gradient? How do we make a step? And how do we clear gradients? So please uh, take a minute or two uh, to fill in those gaps. And raise your hand when you are through.
no no success what kind of problems do you have mm -hmm. two of uh, 34 people succeeded not bad what about uh, others Well, it's uh, straightforward. Uh, so, uh, it, since I have uh, a model, so I can run this cell first. Uh, now I have model, and then I can call this special method model of uh, x batch. So now, now I have this batch of access that is sampled from the uh, my training sample. And so I have trained uh, the, the batch is uh, just random 20, 20 256 uh, elements. And um, Yeah, so uh, I saw I have to uh, choose on the the first column because, uh, as you remember, we have uh, we have binary class and it returns two two columns for the first and for the second class, and then uh, I write the loss function like I did before. Minus uh, torch mean uh, y multiplied by y predicted. Sorry, y batch multiplied by y predicted plus one minus y batch multiplied by Oops, again, sorry. Torch. Logarithm of y predicted. And here, multiplied by torch. Logarithm of y, y minus y predicted. Okay, and then uh, to compute the gradient, uh, it is it is written right here. So we just call this dot backward function. Sorry, Andrew. Yeah. Can can you repeat why we have to do this uh, zero zero gradient in the optimizer? Uh, yeah, let's let's we fin finish. Uh, this uh, code uh, so until the final line so we make a step and then we zero the gradients um, so let let me check that it works yeah it works and the loss function gradually reduces so now answering your question let me scroll back to the example where we had where I called this uh, gradients uh, grad computed the gradients by hand. So we had this uh, simple computation, and those gradients are initialized with zero values. And every time the uh, chain rule passes through the uh, through the specific tensor it increases the gradient by the uh, by the derivative if it passes uh, through the same tensor more than once if there is a kind of a, a cyclic loop and because we have a dynamic graph it could be 
pretty much possible that it is so. So you could you could write a loop that that runs uh, the same layer several times, like ten times, and and then you have to compute the gradient for every iteration. And and the the way how you can express the several gradient computation is by adding those differences again and again to the to the same dot grad value. That's why uh, you have values in the gradient uh, that that just increment after every iteration. So if you do not zero those gradients, uh, you you will not be getting to the right direction. Is it clear now? Yes. So. Uh, if you do not uh, set this to zero, you uh, you are summing the gradient with the previous computed gradient. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So you uh, computed uh, with uh, you will mix it with uh, previous iteration of your optimization. OK, um, some uh, helpful tips. Uh, and let's see how our model uh, works on the test data. So uh, here we have to write a simple a uh, piece of code that would predict uh, value for the mm, X test. So remember, we downloaded the data set and it, it is split into two parts. So we take model X test. We take um, the value of the first column, like uh, before, and let me check what was the name of the test uh, test data set. So it it should be probably X capital X capital. X uppercase test, right? And also, uh, we want to be to want it to be either uh, one or zero. And then we can measure the accuracy. We can get this uh, I wonder if this syntax works. So we check if the output, if this is this uh, output of this function and the first column is greater than uh, 0 0.5. If it passes all the accuracy test. X test is not defined. Oh, not. What a shame. What is it complaining about? Uh, you have to convert it to torch tensor. It's numpy. Ah, uh, yeah. 
is correct. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I have to convert it to to a NumPy uh, because all the all the functions that are used for accuracy evaluation are uh, coming from NumPy. So I have Tensor uh, here, Torch Tensor, and and I have to convert it to NumPy like this. No, the, the X test is uh, NumPy, so you have to convert it to tensor to pass it through the model. Ah, that's correct. Thank you. It also complains that it is uh, it is not possible to uh, convert it to a NumPy uh, because it is uh, an an an, uh, an object that has been created with required gradient. Although <laughs> I am not sure if gradients are really required. Okay, so it uh, doesn't have NumPy. By the way. Let's uh, split in, split it into smaller chunks. So let's see what is the output here. Yeah, so we have uh, a few thousand of elements of the prediction, which is fine. Now, uh, I want to convert into NumPy, and it says that uh, the variable requires grad if we have to detach it first, and then we call NumPy afterwards. OK. And, and here we have uh, NumPy array, a uh, two-dimensional NumPy array. Uh, we have to convert into one-dimensional uh, and let's let's actually check the shape of this array. So yeah, it, it's uh, one dimensional. You have uh, nine nine uh, thousand thirty seven elements here. So you have to convert into one dimensional uh, thing. Um, I think that that now it works. If you put that below. Like this, just but with the brackets, like before. Oops. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so so we we managed to pass the first two asserts 
Uh, and now we have to make sure that the uh, output is um, is an integer value. So we compare it with 0 0.5. And voila. So uh, we get accuracy above the threshold. So uh, it was just a beginning or just a very, very basic introduction to, to, the, to the PyTorch. So of course there are uh, more things you would have to read and, and, and try before getting practical uh, with this stuff. I would recommend you to also take a look at this. Uh, gradient descent, uh, gradient descent uh, explanation to get yourself familiar uh, with with um, differences of different uh, differences of optimizers. So uh, here is an uh, explanation how those work and uh, some some tests that, that allow you to self-control how how you uh, how you how you're doing. So it, it, I think it it would be really helpful. And also uh, some links to the uh, PyTorch tutorials, uh, how it works on on GPU, how it works on uh, different kinds of objects like uh, pictures, like text, etc. And uh, also uh, it, it has di different kinds of different kinds of models that you can just download and, and you don't have to train it from the scratch yourself. And there are some techniques that allow uh, to, to plug in pre-trained model uh, to the um, uh, to your to your settings, to, to your problem. So you just pick some parts, some weights from from already good enough models, and then add uh, a few layers on top of it, and it, it, it actually is trading much faster. So there are some tasks uh, for you to play with uh, PyTorch. Uh, some of them are trivial, like writing this function and, and looking at the pictures that, that you get. Um, some of them may be a, a more complicated uh, that would, uh, would, would require uh, some introduction of mm, convolution operation. Um, so if, if you're not uh, familiar with uh, convolution, uh, I can I can just briefly show you one slide, and I, I hope uh, during the rest of this course you will get introduced to it properly. Just let me switch. Uh, browser to the you know, to, to the to the slides with. Uh, description of convolution. So I believe this would be um, helpful. So you see this um, original picture that you have that is displayed in the grayscale pixels. And you have a green uh, square that, that has some kind of shape in it uh, and, and this shape is pretty arbitrary it, it is just uh, uh, some some coefficient some nine coefficients that uh, define this square and uh, convolution is when you compute the dot product of uh, uh, dot product and and uh, some of those elements uh, 
of the square with everything that sits on uh, below this square. So you position this square at every uh, possible uh, location on top of the background image. Like you see, it, it moves from left to right and from top to bottom. And for every position of this square, green square, you compute the uh, convolution operation, which is which is a uh, which is a sum of uh, dot product elements uh, that, that 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 you get um, between green and 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 grayscale elements. And uh, to, to, to compute this game of life, you would have to uh, just use those mm, rules of convolutions. So, so you just uh, apply uh, this simple matrix three by three to every position to count number of neighbors. So it is the only uh way how you can <laughs> so it is the way how you can compute neighbors of a given cell so if you apply this convolution to every position it will give you number of neighbors around this position so it is it is possible it's actually quite efficient to uh code um, this game of life uh, using PyTorch uh, simple uh, simple syntax, I would say. Okay, and uh, one more thing I wanted to show you, uh, so you could or maybe work a little bit more. Um, it is about applying those techniques that we discussed today to the example coming from particle physics. It is uh, a notebook that is already in the GitHub repository. Uh, you can find it in the seminar folder. Uh, it is called uh, number three linear models LHCB uh, PID. Uh, so PID is a particle identifier. And let's uh, have a, a, a quick look at this, at this notebook. For some reason, uh, GitHub is slow. So uh, while it's loading, uh, something went wrong. Very nice. While it's reloading, I'll just uh, open another call-up window. Yeah, it worked for the second time. Um, so um, let's take a look at this notebook uh, in the closer. Uh, perspective. So uh, here we download a data set uh, that contains LHCB um, Monte Carlo simulation uh, that, that, that um, it, is, it, it is LHCB like, maybe it's not like official LHCB, but LHCB like simulation that we've, we've used uh, for education purposes for many years already. Uh, and there are uh, fields that correspond to output of different sub detectors. Uh, 
Uh, and for simplicity's sake, we uh, would, would um, consider a problem of binary classification k from pi -ons. So <clears throat> uh, we take all the features from, from our data set uh, that are not labeled. And uh, we then split the data set into training and testing sample. Uh, and then we look what kind of accuracy can we get if we just use every specific feature as a classifier output. So it uh, intuitively gives us the um, discrimination power that we get just looking at single feature and and we get uh, and, and we get uh, for some reason it doesn't contain uh, an output an output that would be uh, really nice to look at let me then open it in google collab and run Okay, uh, so now uh, we uh, have to load this data set and import the module. It's uh, not the not the smallest data set you see, even compressed in compressed form, it takes uh, 200 gigabyte, 200 megabytes. Uh, so there are million, one million two hundred thousand elements. Uh, so we would be interested in getting features from this uh, from this data set, and then comparing, splitting the data set, and then we build the scoreboard, leaderboard of, of different features. Uh, but of different features with uh, respect to the labels, with uh, how well those individual features discriminate between cayons and pions. So uh, here, here it is. So we we select just top ten features. So once again, it is it is an individual feature. It doesn't. Uh, so we don't take into account correlation of the feature features uh, between each other. Uh, this is something that a model that we haven't trained yet has to take into account. So uh, now, if we want to train a classifier, uh, we take those ten best features and feed those features into a logistic regression model. Uh, you see that uh, the main worker here is just logistic regression. And uh, here we just call fit and, and then predict uh, probabilities, uh, predict probabilities uh, for every element in the training and testing sample. And uh, then it prints area under rock curve for training and testing sample. Um, and what we're going to see now is that uh, the score, uh, score of the 
overall model <clears throat> of this linear model, logistic regression model that contains 10 best features is going to be less uh, than the score of individual features. Oops. Uh, Um, interesting. So it seems like it, it spent some time trying to learn something and it didn't converge. I, I, the only thing I'm not sure about how many iterations has it, uh, has it used by default. So let's check. <clears throat> Yes, so the default value is 100. Let's uh, increase it two times and run again. So <clears throat> while while it computes, um, uh, what what uh, we can do to understand the reason uh, for the for the de decrease? Uh, so we will notice that ranges of individual features are <clears throat> sitting in uh, quite different uh, quite different uh, scales. They have different scales, and uh, there are some strange values uh, that are decoded like minus 999 uh, which which uh, in in uh, LHCB case means that there is no value available so it's, it is it is essentially none value so uh, if we manage to deal with those two problems uh, we can improve quality of our classifier quite a bit. You remember uh, when we discussed uh, decision trees, we mentioned that it doesn't depend on the scale of the values because for, for, for the tree, it is not important to make a split um, using just regular values or normalized values. Uh, it, it looks at the information criteria uh, that, that do not depend on the absolute values. So information criteria is about uh, relative uh, relative uh, values or relative information that 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 uh, is there no matter which scale we look at. And, and for logistic regression, it is not the case. For neural networks, it is not the case. Because for logistic regression, the distance that, that we measure by mean squared error is the key. And if it is not possible to uh, find a good approximation using some, some function, it, it uh, shows very big numbers very big uh, values of errors. So it's still complaining about um, that LBFGs fail to converge. Let's see if we can plug a different optimizer. Um, from, 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 from. Penalty. Tolerance. Maybe we can increase tolerance. It's also could be. A solution. Say to one to uh, 10 to minus. Three or we can change the solver from LBFGs 
to Newton uh, Newton conjugate gradients. That is also could be an option. Uh, let's try a different solver first. Okay, and uh, so coming back to the uh, way how we can fix these problems, uh, we define the, the method get features. So it is uh, it does the pre-processing of our data. Uh, the first uh, thing is a robust scalar, <clears throat> which scales the features into uh, into the region. Uh, I think it should be uh, normal normal distribution not normal distribution uh, trying to fit into a normal distribution. And uh, for the for the second problem, um, we examine those uh, features with uh, these non values and um, we can replace those strange mi minus 999 uh, values with the mean of the corresponding feature uh, but since we, in such way, we, we can lose some important information, uh, like uh, the absence of the of the value may be an important. We encode it into a different feature uh, that that we save as well. So uh, we, we add uh, an outlier column and uh, it, it is a, uh, it has the value uh, of the mean value uh, that, that we compute. Uh, okay, and so we uh, do the training again. Let's check if uh, the previous training has managed to converge. It's still running. So um, after we introduce um, those two feature transformations, uh, we can apply those transformations to our data set, and then we train a linear model on top of on top of those two features, and then we examine the. Uh, performance of the model and see what is what is the uh, accuracy of, of this model and and we'll notice that it, it uh, improves compared to this DLL K on alone. Um, okay, so and and uh, this example actually. Uh, uses just a logistic regression uh, of a simple kind. And since you are now familiar with decision trees and with neural networks, I would encourage you uh, to, to take some time and to play with those, uh, with this data set, uh, with both with PyTorch and with um, decision trees and, and see if you can improve the accuracy even further. Uh, and then the final part of this notebook is just uh, k-fold cross-validation that allows you to get uh, some some degree of uncertainty that, that uh, such model uh, such model has. This is pretty much eat uh, what what I wanted to cover in uh, those three uh, days of tutorial. Uh, I will post uh, 
the solutions to the GitHub repository uh, a little bit afterwards. So, uh, so, so you would not just copy paste uh, results from there. So you'd have some incentive to to, to practice a bit. Um, now, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. So if, if there are no questions, I would like just to to thank you very much again for, for having joined us these three days. It's been really useful and really productive, I think, for everyone. And I think hopefully uh, this wouldn't be the last time we invite you for something like, for something like this. Um, I hope the next time we can do it in person, but it has been really, really, really useful. Um, so thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just uh, saying I, I, I'm uh, happy to, to spend some time with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, let, let's uh, see how this pandemic things evolve and uh, yeah, let's discuss uh, next iteration of this school. I think it is uh, a really nice initiative. OK, thank you. And, and for the rest of you, just just uh, remind uh, just to um, remind you that we will meet again on Monday next week at nine. I think we can directly use this well the the Teams um, group rather the live rather than the live event. Uh, Josh, uh, are you online? Because I think you yeah. will be sharing. I think it's better that, that they come here directly to the to the um, interactive room, right? Yeah, I agree. Okay. Okay, so thanks again to everyone, especially to Andre. And uh, yeah, we meet next Monday. Okay, have a right. good day. Cheers. Have a good day. Bye-bye.